Greetings, welcome to week two. This week we're talking about Jurassic Park, genetic mutation, nuclear families, and the monstrous gaze. Some key concepts for this week, I just want to break down the three readings that we did. Um, I want to talk about gender ideology in Jurassic Park in relation to Freeland's article. I also want to talk about how unauthorized breeding threatens white, the white nuclear family, according to Briggs and Kelber Kay's argument, and also talk about the quantum gaze. On the surface, Jurassic Park and the fly present positive image, images of strong, intelligent, active women. Jurassic Park presents a 1990s feminist vision of a strong woman. But Ellie's paleobotany, again, this is according to Cynthia Freeland, um, her paleobotany is irrelevant to the male scientists' more important theories and science. Uh, women are chiefly concerned with nourishment and caregiving in these in this film, and of both the men and the dinosaurs. Um, Ellie is pre presented for her sex appeal, according to Freeland. She's younger than Grant. Lex, on the other hand, is afraid most of the time and uses her hacking skills to lock a door, which, according to Freeland, doesn't seem that impressive. All the monsters in the film are female, and... A large variety of them exist, um, but not all of them are monstrous. Freeland argues that Jurassic Park presents culturally, culturally coded negative messages about females through its depiction of the dinosaurs. In other words, there are no sweet, smart dinosaurs. Intelligence is terrifying in dinosaurs as well as in the women, is sort of what this movie is presenting in her opinion. Um, all dinosaurs have a mysterious sexuality that is other. They can convert their sex and reproduce independently, which also seems like a stealing of the phallus. Um, but I, a question that comes up for me about this point is, at what point does this make them no longer associated with women if they can change their gender? Um, and that's something that Detora focuses more on. Um, the dinosaurs represent a threat, according to Freeland, centering on an uncontrolled female sexuality and their awesome reproductive abilities. She is interested in asking who moves the narrative along in Jurassic Park. Men seem to run the show. Um, they're the ones who cause the problems. They're also the ones who end up resolving them. Ellie, in the meantime, is just a nurturing woman caring for a sick triceratops and later Malcolm went after he gets injured, which shows shows her as caring and nurturing. Um, the film's gender ideology reinforces that women can be brave and caring and nurturing. Um, I'm sorry. The film's gender ideology reinforces that women can be brave and scientific, but must remain pretty and nurturing. The film's end produces a happy nuclear family, with Grant finally be, being able to be this father that he wasn't able to be in the beginning. Um, and the film ends up endorsing a male heroic scientist's creative vision. Right, so according to Freeland, this is kind of the white nuclear family that um, is produced at the end here with Ellie and Grant and Lex and Tim. And here again in the helicopter scene in the, at the end of the film. And this white nuclear family is being contrasted to this more monstrous family, right? Where um, a monstrous overbreeding family headed by female monsters who devour one another. And here you can see a raptor trying to eat a T-Rex, and then the T-Rex tr tries to eat the raptor. <clears throat> According to Briggs and Kelber K, how, however, um, genetics is a reproductive issue. They argue that Genes and gender in science fiction films figure as markers of tension between the sciences, or genetics, and nature, or gender. The meaning of nature is reconfigured in films about genetics. Reproductive technology pushes the nature-culture dualism back onto women and natural childbirth, where before it had rested on genes. So they're reading Gattaca and Jurassic Park as anti-feminist works, where genetic technology poses a threat to pure and natural family structures. Mothers as heterosexual, unfeminist, white nuclear family members are seen as natural and good in these films. Um, both films are critiques of new genetic technologies which reinscribe the natural by locating nature 
in motherhood. Genetic technology, furthermore, is only performed by men, which contrasts with natural maternity. Um, and at the same time, it also makes these films reiterations of a Frankenstein narrative in that a man is trying to create a woman without the help of a woman, right? Um, perhaps they, they overlook that Ellie is a scientist, though not a geneticist. Um, there are a few women on, on Wu and Hammond's team that I think Spielberg is careful to, to show, even though they don't have speaking roles, which I'll show in a second here. Um, these authors, Briggs and Kelber K, read Jurassic Park as underscoring the unnatural reproduction of third world monsters, which relies on the knowledge of third world mothers as overpopulating. Jurassic Park shows a white nuclear family threatened from within by feminism and threatened from without by third world monsters. So, again, here's a shot of inside the lab, and we'll see Detora takes issue with Briggs and Kelber K's claim that only men do science. Um, in this panning shot, uh, you can see a woman here over to the right with her hair in a bun is, is in this lab um, doing some work, even though she doesn't have a speaking role. Um, and perhaps it's also worth noting that they're white women. But Ellie <laughs> here is kind of literally up to her arms in shit um, doing science. Um, she's looking for evidence of what is making this animal sick. I mean, why? and while she doesn't find any evidence that West Indian lilac is causing this illness, which she, which is her in initial hypothesis, um, it still might reinforce that she's a strong woman. Um, on the other hand, it might reinforce Freeland's argument that women are represented as strong and independent and even scientists in this movie, but they ultimately fail to move the plot along. Um, she doesn't really make a worthwhile discovery or contribution because nothing comes of her hypothesis, right? Um, so there's a couple different ways to look at it, and I'm curious to know what you think of Ellie as a character, whether you see her as a, a feminist character. I think some of the authors also disagree about how to read her. Um, I think... Detora reads her as more her dress as more butch, um, whereas Freeland reads her as more of a sex object with with her legs um, being constantly visible. So I think that's also up for debate. So I'm curious to hear any thoughts that you, that anyone has on this for this week. Briggs and Kelber K continue, however, in Jurassic Park, cloning and strong females are straightforwardly bad. Cloning in this film breaches the nature technology boundary, um, but produces monstrous mothers who produce without males. The film upholds the myth of women as out of control producers of violent children, destroying the nuclear family. Um, and at the same time, I'm wondering if their reading perhaps lends too much attention to the dinosaurs and not enough attention to the women in the film. Um, but that's another issue. The dinosaurs are coded as female and non-white. The monsters exhibit anxieties about race. The In the book, um, Crichton relies on tropes of family, but each family fails to conform to a white middle-class ideal. Crichton's goal in the book, they argue, is to put white people in nuclear families and to signal the irredeemable difference of non-white people through the incapacity of families to produce this ideal. So they also they point out a number of differences to the book between the book and the film, right? In the novel, um, Grant loves kids and Tim is there to protect Lex. In the film, Grant hates kids. He learns to love them. Um, and Grant ends up protecting Tim, though he does kind of a bad job of it because he still gets electrocuted. Um, so in the novel, the white family of humans with men in control is contrasted with dinosaur families headed by females breeding out of control. Um, there's this point about lysine that comes up in the film, which I didn't think was addressed too much in their article, but at one point, um, Mr. Arnold, who's plays, played by Sam Jackson in the film, talks about how the dinosaurs have lysine in their genetic code, which suggests that they would die if they ever escaped the park. Um, so I don't know what that does to the whole theory that life kind of will find a way if that's supposed to be read as 
being supplanted by their evolving out of that lysine gene or um or yeah or how that ties into the, to their reading they don't really talk about that and i'd be curious to know if anybody has thoughts on that issue as well jurassic park is about the dangers of manipulating genes Crichton's anti-feminism in the novel is apparent in the story of good reproduction occurring in white nuclear families where gender roles are adhered to and bad reproduction takes place in third world fam families. Crichton blames women for raising children without fathers he, who, who turn out badly, right? Um, he highlights the negative consequences of feminism. In Jurassic Park, females learn to be mothers and female-headed households are monstrous. The story of dinosaurs escaping and breeding unfolds through family tropes. The white homogeneous nuclear middle class family has the best chance of survival in this film and in the novel. Non-white families can reproduce without males, but they reproduce monstrously. White adults and children become family. So again, we see Grant and Sattler are sort of these parents in waiting in the book. They talk about one or Ellie talks about wanting children in the beginning of the film. Um, Grant in the book loves kids. Tim and Lex are also sort of these improperly gendered children in the book. Um, in both the, the film and the book, Tim and Lex's parents are mid-divorce. Um, so this, this story is about turning four white characters into a family. And in a weird way, the family is almost kind of a Frankensteinian monster, too, because it's not a real family. They're all just sort of being brought together and occupying these roles of family. Um, um, the lawyer we see is punished for leaving the kids alone. In the book, Tim is the one who's sort of hacking into computers, not Lex. Uh, Crichton is obsessed with this idea of race mixing and the belief that non-white races are engendering the white, quote-unquote, us of the nuclear family. Um, Hammond is sort of failing as a paternal figure in both the novel and the, the film. Um, he fails to appreciate how monstrous his children and dinosaurs really are. Um... The authors, Briggs and Kelber K, argue that the uncontrolled female breeding in matriarchal families in the third world threaten the future of human life on the planet. Dinosaurs incarnate the racialized problem of gender. Um, they also talk about how Africa is a threat for Crichton, which is why he uses the DNA of West African frogs as the thing that allows for nature to quote unquote find a way and for breeding to escape the control of the male geneticists in the park. He also talks about how um, Muldoon is also a colonial huntsman and the race of the dinosaurs is marked by their colonial association, right? So their sex changes when too many of one sex is, exist is existing in one place and this, so the stress is kind of a biological corrective for improper gender. Um, but the dinosaurs are also products of multinational capitalism. Crichton, they also see Crichton's racism sort of apparent in his attitude towards Japanese investors, that humans sort of must pay for playing with nature. Um, masculine tool using and scientific knowledge are heroic in these in both the film and the, the novel. Um, Grant and Tim are kind of these heroes in the book. Good science can save from the bad or misused sciences, which is, again, maybe a, a theme we see playing out in Frankenstein as well. Um, the film's project seems to be to get Grant to care about children. Um, and Malcolm survives because he's a father. He says he has three kids. So, thinking about these two articles so far, we can sort of pause here for some questions. First of all, is Jurassic Park another kind of frontier narrative? Is the border between the present and the past being overcome with genetics in this film, it's sort of bringing dinosaurs back to life? How does the position 
How does that position Lex and Ellie on the island? Though Ellie doesn't lose anything, she arguably does have a descent in this film um, when she turns the power back on, and she must escape the raptors, which ate Mr. Arnold, right? So we get this shot from the bottom of the stairs, and she has to go down. Kind of reminiscent of Rushing's article about aliens and thinking, too, about Ripley going back down into the, um, the lair to fight this devouring mother to rescue Newt in Aliens. Uh, another question we could ask is how do racial politics enter into the film? We'll think more about this next week, I think, but it's something to think about with this film. Um, how do we read the dinosaurs as racially coded? Um, also, what does it mean that the first person to die is a Costa Rican worker? Um, Sam Jackson, Sam Jackson's character also dies in this film. Um, and another question to think about is, I, I want to return to this question after we talk about de Torres article as well. Um, but the third question here in the fly, how, how might Briggs and Kelber Kay's argument speak to the fly where Brundle fly hopes to unite himself, Ronnie and the baby together, together to become this ultimate family. Um, that film can also be read as this kind of Frankensteinian narrative because of how Brundle's transporter accidentally becomes a gene splicer. Um, so I guess I'm wondering if Brundlefly could be read as a critique of a patriarchal nuclear family um, where instead of preventing unauthorized breeding, he hopes to control Ronnie's reproduction and to use her body in the same way that he uses his transporters. I don't know. I'm just trying to think across articles here and across films. So to think about de Torres intervention into Freeland and Briggs and Kelber Kay's arguments, de Torres looks at looking relations and the representation of, of the maternal as monstrous in this film. Um, she looks at how spectatorship has been framed by Mulvey, Lacan and Foucault for her. She seeks to revise Freeland's claim that the female gaze, which incorporates the view of the monster, translates into victimization. A looking binary is reductive and simplistic. She argues that the mother figures in Jurassic Park become monsters when they are not available to any gaze. Their invisibility is, is key to generative and deadly powers. Jurassic Park is horror because it relies on the workings of monstrosity. So, where Freeland argues that woman is often sacrificed to the desire to know about the monster, um, and Jurassic Park is Freeland's example of a film yielding a feminist reading that considers women in the roles of, of the film's plot, de Tora is arguing that Freeland offers a reductive gender representation, and she points out that, first of all, all the victims of the dinosaurs in this film are men, and in that way, this film is very much like Aliens um, and could be read as a feminist text. Against Freeland's point that the white nuclear family excludes the ethnic inhabitants of the island, DeTora argues that the white family leaving the island is imported to begin with, so the nuclear family should be ejected at the end, right? Um, and this also sort of has implications that they're their quote-unquote vacation seems to participate in a colonialist or um, imperialist project. De Tora argues that the insertion of the nuclear family into the experimented milieu is the orig originary problem that creates the monsters in the first place. Hammond brings a nuclear family to the park to prove that it will appeal to family audiences. Um... And again, this this is another way I see the the family here functioning as a kind of Frankensteinian creation. Hammond cannot dis discern between danger and safety. Hammond is the one who's collapsing boundaries between illusion and reality, which is another way that maybe this is a frontier narrative, right? Um, he chides Nedry as a father would a child, and Nedry says, thanks, Dad. Um, he also collapses the boundaries between work, illusion, reality, family, and dinosaurs. The nuclear family cannot fix the park. It must be saved from it. 
Furthermore, Ellie's feminism is apparent in her choice of men by the end of the film. Um, according to Detora, Ellie sort of has this choice between Malcolm or Grant, and that's not really resolved at all. Um, it's her body, it's her choice. Grant and the kids contrast with the dinosaur family of the raptors. Against Freeland, Detora also argues that men don't act as agents motivating the film's action as much as the dinosaurs do, whose gender remains questionable. So again, if, if these dinosaurs can change gender, that, that kind of troubles the idea that they're definitely associated with the females in the, in the film. Um, the men don't necessarily drive the plot because they don't necessarily fix anything, which I think is also a valid point. The dinosaurs overpower male intentions. Men who get eaten register as impotent or unable to fix the problems that exist. Um, Malcolm is stronger than the men employed at the park. Lex and Ellie fix the problems that the men cannot. They make the containment of the dinosaurs possible. So, and in that sense, Lex, like, just figuring out how to close a door, that actually is a really important moment because she saves it and I think I maybe Freeland is being a bit reductive when she says that that's not an important moment um, Briggs and Kelber K argue that Jurassic Park identifies genetics research as an unnatural form of reproduction which reinforces natural modes of mothering Briggs says that the film minimizes the discourse about race and the uncontrolled third world population which are important to the book's critique of genetic research the authors argue Crichton's misogyny is softened in the film. But Detora argues that Briggs and Kelber K doesn't consider the visual aspects of the film. She also addresses their polemical points by saying that, that Ellie Sattler does do science, which I showed a clip of before. Um, so the men are not the only people, quote-unquote, doing science in the film. Detora also points out how Briggs overlooks Ellie's feminism. Ellie interacts with the paleontology site. Um, and she inter Detora intervenes into Freeland's argument by saying that Jurassic Park is constructed on an island in crisis where only female figures can transcend the disorder, even though it's still a colonial narrative, since it's a white woman reordering a colonial space. Ellie outdoes the men... Um, in the action hero paradigm in this way. Ellie nurtures Malcolm and risks her life to reactivate the park. Though, in that sense, I'm also wondering if that point overlooks the fact that she kind of unknowingly electrocutes Tim. I wonder if that troubles her as a, as a nurturing figure, since when she turns the power on, Tim gets electrocuted. Um, she also does this despite Hammond's chivalrous offer to turn the power on himself. They have that little exchange before she marches off to um, turn on the power. But I, again, I'm wondering if this, if that interaction is even an example of feminism. Um, is, is that a, I guess I'm wondering what, how do you define feminism and is feminism having a woman do something simply because a man is too old to do it or frail or too incompetent to do it? Um, so I'm interested how folks are reading that that scene as well. So Detora also introduces this idea of the quantum gaze. She says that Ellie is the object of Malcolm's gaze in the film, so there is a male gaze at work, but the dinosaurs who are of an uncertain gender possess the gaze more than the voyeuristic heterosexual male viewer. Um, I think this is a good point because... This is, after all, a body genre, so the pleasures of viewing seem to reside in the squirming we do in response to the dinosaurs' monsters, right? The reflections of the dinosaurs in the rearview mirror and in the kitchen capture a dual gaze. The creature doing the looking is in charge of the action until the camera's vantage shifts. And some examples of this... So here's when Muldoon is about to shoot the, the raptor. Um, we can see it sort of looking back at us as we're peering over Muldoon's shoulder. But then the shot circles around, and then um, 
he's suddenly surrounded by the two from, it's almost as if we're occupying the space of another raptor in this shot, right? And this is the precise scenario that Grant describes to the child at the beginning of the film when he talks about the two raptors will come from the sides that you didn't even know were there, right? Um, so in that sense, Muldoon here is almost infantilized by the, the clever girl of this raptor or the shot itself. And at the same time, the Tyrannosaurus Rex can't see Grant and Lex as long as they don't move. And as a body genre, <coughs> the horror film here seems to be testing the audience's ability to hold our breath. Um, it seems like we're only safe from the, the monstrous gaze if we do not exhibit fear. So de Tora argues that power is more significant than gender in these looking relations. She uses Schrodinger's cat, a paradox that explains the physical relations between quantum particles and larger entities. Quantum theory says that the act of observing changes, changes the physical circumstances so that the cat in a box of poison gas is only dead or alive when the particles in question are viewed. Now, I don't, I don't uh, profess to understand <laughs> quantum physics or even this analogy of Schrodinger's cat, but I do think what it says about visual is important to this film and to Detour's argument. So the paradox of Schrodinger's cat says the cat cannot be both alive and dead at once. Um, Schrodinger uses the example to illustrate the absurdity of, exist of the existing view of quantum mechanics. So he's kind of comes up with this example as like a sarcastic... Um, or ironic aside um, to, a, to an argument, or a ridiculous example, right? The, the Copenhagen interpretation implies that the cat remains both alive and dead until the state is observed. Um, Schrodinger's cat explains why the dinosaurs in the film are monstrous. They are well-behaved as long as they are in sight. The dinosaurs disappear when their presence is demanded and emerge only when the fence malfunctions. The dinosaurs who resist scientific and carceral gaze are the most monstrous. Um, and in a way, you can think of how this works in other horror films. Even in another film directed by Steven Spielberg, Jaws, I, I think he was contractually, contractually obligated not to show the shark for the first hour of that film. Um, so he relies on other things like music and a woman being pulled under the water to sort of signify the shark instead of showing the actual monster, right? Um, Detora argues that the monstrosity of the dinosaur's maternity has more to do with a violation of looking relations and the resting away of reproductive process from male intervention. This is precisely what makes breeding among females possible. Monstrous, unauthorized female males reject female identity and controlled reproduction in order to return to natural maternity. <clears throat> so the moral of the film is that natural maternity is superior to genetic manipulation. And in that sense, it seems like she would agree with Briggs and um, Kepler K on that, on that point. So this shot of the T-Rex with the arm on the wire calls attention to how it only lets itself be seen when it poses the greatest threat to human tourists. It also sort of gives an example of how smart the dinosaur is by testing the fence. Um, the other ways this gaze sort of operates <coughs> is when they're on the, the tour through the park and they're looking for the Dilophosaur. Um, and the film seems to disappoint them as well as the viewer here in the same way that we hear the raptors tear apart this cow, but we don't actually see it until we don't see the raptors until they're out of the their carceral space right and in case you are unfamiliar with the idea of the panopticon or a carceral gaze this is this is an example of what she's talking about clive barker's invention which foucault also theorizes in um, discipline and punish and this is a, a great illustration of how power rests in the gaze. The warden, who's situated in the center of the prison here, can see everyone, can see every cell. 
but the prisoners can only see the warden, the warden, and a lim- they have a very limited gaze. So she's she's suggesting that the pleasures or the comfort in looking rests in being able to see the thing when we are supposed to see it. Um, and that's sort of the anxiety that's being played with in this film. This expected look is constantly and generically denied in horror film. But the body genre of horror plays with this expectation about sight. Terror rests in the expectation of sight. The maternal monsters, then, are monstrous because they are, they are several things at once until they are fixed in a gaze. Forbidden sight does not exist until it is gazed upon. Um, so some final questions we can ask here are, first, um, is Jurassic Park a feminist text? We have a, a few options. I think Briggs and Kelber K and Freeling would argue that it's not, but Detora might argue that it is. Is Ellie a feminist? Um, and what does feminist mean in such, such a question, right? So the shot of Ellie saying no to Hammond, um, when she says we can discuss sexism when I get back, um, might be a place to look at here. I, I'd be interested how pe- how people would would read that scene. We've talked about how women are survivors in the films we've looked at so far, and how women can be sacrificed to reveal the the monster. Um, but another thing I'm wondering about is how how is race functioning in these films. And again, we'll get to this more next week, but um, Malcolm... So one thing to keep in mind is that um, Jeff Goldblum actually is an African-American actor, even though he's very light-skinned, and I think sometimes... um, um, is often cast to kind of play more quote-unquote white parts. Um... So is his speech about, he, he gives this speech at one point in the film, he says, what you call discovery, I call the rape of the natural world. Uh, Jeff Goldblum's also appeared in other movies at this point, like The Fly, so he's sort of associated with um, uh, this kind of genre. And another film I could have, we could have watched in this class, I think, is Independence Day, which is another movie about aliens that stars Jeff Goldblum. Um, but I'm wondering if his point about <coughs> what you call discovery, I call the rape of the natural world, does that make the film a frontier narrative about a colonial history that casts Hammond, who's this white, rich capitalist who's kind of always dressed in white and has attractions in Ni- Nairobi, Kenya? <coughs> does it cast him as a colonizer? Are you, reading, are you reading Malcolm as a guest of color in the park? Is his argument a point about colonialism, or is he just making it because he's the only chaotician there, right? Um, Is there a link between chaos theory and colonialism? Um, So yeah, I'm just wondering, too, how how victimhood is racialized or gendered in this film, or in horror film more generally. So try to think about some of those questions for this week, and I'm very curious to see what you come up with. Okay, thanks a lot.